Hello, and welcome to episode 134 of Just Keep Writing. A podcast for writers. By writers. To keep you writing. I'm Marshall. I'm Nick. I'm Brent. And I'm Will. And joining us this week, again, after it's been a while, uh, Suyi Davies Okumboa is with us to talk about his book, Son of the Storm. Welcome back to the show, my friend. It's been a long time. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm glad to be here. Nice to see all you. Your faces. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, have, we haven't seen your face in real life in a long time, but, um, but it's nice. This is just as good, I feel like. We get to chat. That that's is, good. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Technology right. just brings oh, everyone I'm, together. <laughs> All right, I'm throwing it to you, Will. What you got? Sure. Start us off. So we interviewed Sui three years ago, and you can check out episode 41, which is titled God Hunter, after his debut novel, David Mogo, God Hunter. We talked about uh, Sui starting out writing, NaNoWriMo, his amazing tweet that went viral, the Hugos, and of course, his debut. So we're back with a brand new book that is, uh, we're going to talk about book one of The Nameless Republic, uh, titled Son of the Storm. So Sui, give us the pitch for Son of the Storm. Uh, okay. How do I do this without giving a pitch for the whole series? Because that's how I started to think about it. But um, Son of the Storm really is um a uh, world <laughs> where at which there's the center a city called Basat the center and a scholar from that city discovers an ancient manuscript that sort of um dredges up secrets that you know the powers that be in this city have been trying to hide for a long time including forgotten magic um the existence of peoples that have been thought to be um non-existent uh, and the revelation of these secrets pretty much uh, start a spiral um, for him, the scholar, but also for other people he comes in contact with, as well as for the empire as a whole. Uh, and for the rest of the series, we see where that spiral leads. Amazing. So we're going to ask a question that we tend to ask every guest. So describe the writing of this book in three words. Hmm. Wow, that's that's a toughie. Is it three connected words or like just three no, separate words? Random, no, random. Whatever comes to your mind. Three random first. words. Yeah. Mm, three random words of Son of the Storm, right? Yeah. Yeah, of Son of the Storm. Yeah. I would say it was. Um, I'd start with it, enchanting. Um, I, I could talk, uh, you know, a bit more about these words, but enchanting is the first. The second would be grueling. <laughs> <laughs> and the third will be um, introspective. Oh, nice. You always pick good words. Uh, so <laughs> we are going to unpack all those words and what they mean to you. So talk to us about okay. enchanting. Um, there's this thing about like... Um, uh, so there, there are three modes I typically get into when I'm writing something. The first is when I'm sort of like sussing out, um, sussing out the story, right? Like, what am I trying to do here? What am I trying to say? What, what is this gonna encompass, embody, etc.? And a lot of that feels very much like puzzle pieces coming together, right? Um, and at that time, I'm, I feel like I'm in the room of this, like, I mean, this like. It's like when you sit with, it's like if you're a potter and you're sitting with all this clay, right? But you have an idea of like what the final shape is, but you have all this clay around you and they're not sure what that's going to look like. So in that way, you can see the final, the final shape doesn't really feel much like the final shape yet. And it can feel very much like uh, what I like to think of as like m m menial, like it can feel like physical labor in a way, right? Because you're, yeah. you're really like throwing stuff, right? Trying to see if it works, you know, putting stuff off, putting stuff back. Um, and I think this story sort of was one that had that, but managed to also have some sort of that magic. So typically when I go through that, past that stage, right? And then I do the writing, when I'm revising, that's when I usually get into the stage where the work itself starts to enchant me, the author, where I start to feel like, this is something, you know, that gets me to think things, to feel things, to 
to read it like a reader, if this makes sense. I start to really get into the reader space then and sort of leave the creator space. But Son of the Storm had that enchantment, I think, from the beginning because um, the process of creating itself was also one that like got me to see all the possibilities that the work held. Uh, I was like, and I was enamored by the work as I was creating it. It didn't. Re- I, that doesn't typically happen for me. Um, I usually get to that stage somewhere around revisions. Um, and so, Son of, Son of the Storm and Nameless Republic in general had this like. It was a work I would I would look at and feel like this was, you know, this this is good. This is there's there's magic in this work and not in the literal sense of magic. Like there's the magic of story. There's the magic of true emotion. There's the magic of relationships. It's like all the things that I was trying to hit, I was I would read them and right? I would read the chapter before I start the next chapter the next day, and I would feel like. There's, there's, there's magic in that prose. There's magic in that story there. It just makes sense. So I, I, I did feel the enchantment of the story while I was writing it, which I typically don't get to. So that's why I would say that. Um, and I think that has continued through the series. Um, and part of the reason for that is because the story is a bit bigger than, than just, um, than just telling the story. It was because I was drawing so much from places that are, um, like close to home, right? I was drawn from like, you know, the Benin Kingdom, like pre-colonial times. And I was like drawn from physical spaces that I actually went to visit um, for like inspiration, right? To design these, this secondary world. It did feel very much like that for that reason. And then oh. grueling because writing a book of like a hundred and... I, I, the first draft was a hundred and... It was like a hundred and... 20 something and then it ended up I, I cut like it was 120 something thousand words and then I cut like um maybe 40k <laughs> oh, wow. and then I added yeah well maybe not 40 maybe like 30k words and then I added back and the final was like 148 or something so it was like it was a lot of editing and it was very grueling and I was working for the first time with my editor who's like super into like pushing you to like do the best work you know she was she's like very everyone like she's known in the industry for like asking you to that you know like squeezing that juice of like you can do better (laughs) out of Mm. you you know and i I, i'm really appreciative of that because like it has definitely made me into a better writer um and it has definitely sort of made my process more you know it has yeah i've sort of imbibed those questions where i then ask them of myself now you know, within my own process. So that's useful, but it was definitely grueling. Um, so War of the Wind was even more so, but um, I think these two books are the ones that have most challenged me across everything I've ever written. So yeah, I would definitely say grueling. And then the third introspective is because, um, because of, so one of, this book is about, has at the core, a lot of discussions about power. And what it made me do was to think about how power functions across all these multiple axes and how those interplay, not just in the world of the story, but also I had to do that. I had to think about how that plays out in our world, the real world, right? Um, and it, I think the writing of this book has made me like be more attentive just generally as a person to how um, you know power, privilege, the ideas of things like freedom or truth um, exists on all these axes of, of, of access, of privilege, of power, right? Um, and and sort of like each time we, we we approach a character in Son of the Storm or War of the Wind, it's almost like we're asking that question of them each time. Where do they sit in the tapestry of this world? What point? At what point do they exist, right? In this uh this tapestry that this world is and how how do they have access to things blah 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 and so it's almost asks me to ask questions of characters that i might have overlooked if i was just writing something else right i had to say why would they make this choice but but why would they make that decision uh but what would they do how how can they do that do they have you know the freedom to do that do they have the power to do that do they have the access to certain things etc so it really did get me to think much deeper than i typically would um, and again, that has also made its way into my work that has come post writing of this book. Um, so yeah, that's, that's the explanation <laughs> for all three words. Yeah. I was going to, um, ask, you know, if I re- recall correctly from 
us talking previous, um, this started as a NaNoWriMo book in 2016. Did you say that in our last interview? In 2016, um, I did write some part of it during NaNoWriMo. Um, yeah. It didn't start at NaNoWriMo because I had the idea before. Um, mm-hmm. But yes, it did start. Um, it did start with the idea around 2016. That is correct. Um, but I started writing the the parts that I had to like say, well, this is this is what the book is going to be. I did write that part during NaNoWriMo. So while it wasn't quote unquote a NaNoWriMo book, yes, I did write some parts. Amazing. Go ahead, Marshall. Yeah. So I'm curious. A, a couple of things you said. Um, drawing from places you've been or places kind of close to you. So I guess what I want to know just in general, kind of backing up a little bit, but um, the idea to write this particular series of novels in this world, um, the genre, um, and just also like you talked about drawing from your life and stuff. So the interest, uh, inspiration. So why this, what inspired you to write this book? this particular book um, in this genre um, in the way that you did? Well, I'll start with the genre, which is pretty much that um, I grew up reading across genres. Um, so I always like, like I, my parents uh, have been academics like all their lives. So um, that we always had like a library and I would read a lot of stuff. What I found was that actually, now that I think back, I didn't actually have a lot of speculative work as much. But what happened was when I eventually came to speculative stories you know science fiction fantasy and the likes uh, and I, I don't i don't even i wouldn't even say i came through like the traditional route to like epic fantasy that most will where they read like the most dominant epic fantasy stories of the time Tolkien, etc um but more like tangentially right i came there because that was what you know was in the zeitgeist at the time um but the genre really just afforded me the opportunity to to isolate things right sometimes i want to i want to think deep deeply about a specific thing or specific concerns um uh and i think like the the, the you what speculative fiction does is it allows you to take something and isolate it against a different uh so so like contrast it against a different reality if this makes sense right um that's what we do when we're building a world right we take certain things and we contrast it against a different reality that allows that thing to sort of stand out in stark relief Right. And I feel like speculative fiction allows me to do that over and over and over again in different ways each time. That's why I sort of went with it, because it allowed me it afforded me that um, opportunity. This particular story was because I already told myself right from the beginning around, say, 2016, when I started thinking about this world that um, I, I wanted to write epic fantasy at some point. Okay, I just knew I was like, okay, I'm going to write an epic fantasy novel. I didn't even think series at the time, but just like, I know I'm going to write something in Epic Fantasy at some point. The second marker for that decision was that I remember telling myself, um, so what happened was I was living and I grew up in Benin City in Nigeria, which is like, uh, again, uh, uh, very, like it's the, it's the last remaining vestige of like a very ancient um, West African kingdom, the Benin kingdom or Benin empire that like, started out in like about the 1100s and spanned to about 1800s, right? Um, 1897 was the, I think that was when the British had like this, the, the invasion that really ended like the reign of that empire. So what happened was I grew up in Benin City, but I didn't really like, I wasn't very, uh, <laughs> I wasn't very conversant with the history as much, right? Uh, mm-hmm. And so what happened was as I grew up, and I knew like people would tell me stories, right? They'd be like, Oh, the legend of this, or like this, you know, this, this is why this tree is in the middle of the market and no one ever cuts it down because there's a, you know, legend or history behind that. And I, I knew some of these stories, but I would, you know, I just treated them as like, okay, they were stories. But what happened was when I started thinking about places I wanted to draw inspiration from to write bigger, fantastic wor- uh, worlds, especially those set in secondary spaces, I was like, well, I don't see any that drop from the kinds of places that I come from, which I know are reaching stories because I've heard those stories. Uh, and so that was like the second thing. I was like, so if I'm going to write an epic fantasy, I'm going to write one that features this space. Okay, so the city of Bassa, if you've read it, um, the design of the city, the architecture, the technology of the time, everything is around mid-century, um, middle 
it's like middle age Benin Empire, which is when it was the, the empire was at its peak, right? So all of the all of the stuff you see in most of the city of Bassa is actually some of them are just like direct lifts from <laughs> um the okay. Benin Empire of the time, but some of them are modified, right? So the world came first in uh first in that way. And then after that I started thinking, okay, so what what would be the concerns of the, you know, of this secondary space that I've built? Who would be the person who would be, you know, coming up against or like encounter friction when 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 existing in this space, right? What kinds of frictions would they encounter and why? And how can they how can some of these frictions blow up into something that could be story worthy, if this makes sense. That was pretty much the process through which I came to the story, right? It started from thinking this I want to center I want to center certain experiences, my experience, my these certain spaces, certain experiences, certain kinds of characters, certain kinds of sub stories. Um and then yeah, and then I picked and sort of chose um I was living in Lagos when I made that decision and I remember going back to Benin City for for like the holidays. And I went and visited some certain spaces. I went to the um, Benin City Museum, which I only went once in like 20 something years of living there. Um, <laughs> I went there as a kid. So I went back as an adult and like went and saw like all the, you know, I, I literally went through every level of the museum to see all the relics and uh, the actual stories and history. I visited certain spaces. I visited where the Benin Empire moats like the last remaining walls of the moats were still there. So I visited those spaces. I visited a guild of of bronze makers, people who still carve bronze and are like descendants of those who used to carve bronze for like bronze pieces for like um, um, royals and like nobles. So oh, like, awesome. for instance, like people who, who are descendants of the people who carved what we would see, say, in the British Museum. Um, so I, I, I did, I did visit a few people like that. I visited a few like ancient b buildings. So some of the architecture from like the great dome or like the big, the cities also come from like some buildings that are still there, stuff like that. So, um, so yeah, that's why, as I said, it was a bit, um, there was like introspection there because I wasn't just thinking abstractly when I was thinking about this world. I was also thinking about the fact that, um, there some, some, slice of this was also some kind of history for someone or some people right um yeah so so that that was pretty much why the story started how it started and you know why it has gone in the direction that it has well and i don't know i just for me i felt like a real place i don't know there was something i don't know if it, it just the descriptions i i mean your writing is beautiful but just the descriptions and the dome and like, and like you said, the construction of the city and everything else just felt, it felt so real and it felt so lived in. Um, and there was a history there. So you, you nailed that for sure. Anyway, that's, well, I'm, glad. To say that. <laughs> I'm glad. <laughs> so one of the things that Epic fantasy does, um, that I love, I love Epic fantasy and I'm work working on one myself. Um, you have a lot of different POVs in this, in this story. Um, but not everybody can write that many POVs and not have it feel kind of overwhelming. You know what I mean? Um, so did you set out from the beginning to use the, as many POVs as you did? I'm curious to see which ones maybe didn't make the cut or, um, and, and did you add more? Cause this is something that I always end up doing is adding more as I need them um, as I'm drafting. So I'm just, I'm just curious about the POV choices, what characters you chose um, and that kind of thing, just because that fascinates me about Epic Fantasy. So. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Thank you. Um, I think it started with knowing that I was just going to have in my, at the time I, I knew, okay, I was going to have at minimum two POVs. That was going to be Dan. So who, you know, discovers everything and mm -hmm. Lilong who is the sort of outsider POV right the person who I wanted us the reader to see Basa differently you know through their POV yeah. um but then something happened when I mean I didn't even start just drafting with both their POVs what happened was when I started writing what I considered like the the sample chapters right the chapters that told me what I was trying to go for um what happened was I realized that there was a certain complexity I was looking for. 
um, in that I wanted us to have a, a variety of voices that presented us with different points of view. Um, because one of the things about POV is it's not just about giving us an, um, a perspective of others or of the world from another person's point of view. It's also an opportunity to build character for the person whose POV we see, right? Mm -hmm. What kind of person is this person? What do they think about themselves is also something we tend to um, forget POV can give you. It's not just about what do others think of them. It's that what do they also think about themselves? What do they think others think about them? All of these things sort of help us shape our perception of the of the character itself. So what happened was, um, so when I make decisions about POV, I make the character decision, I make the perspective decision. And then the third one is I make what I call the event decision, which is like, can we know about certain events if someone is not there to tell us about it? And how much of those events will be crucial to understanding some? So like a good example is if Danso is traveling on the road, how do we know something that's happening in the city if that thing is crucial to something that happens with them so on the road something like that right so mm -hmm. it, it i think it was those three decisions that sort of pointed toward needing multiple povs um and and yeah when i started i was i was i was sort of focused on povs that i felt were, were needed but two things happened to change that the first was a shemi so when i started writing the story the story shemi wasn't actually a, even a protagonist of any sort um, oh man! She was, yeah, it wasn't even. <laughs> what happened was that she was supposed to be like uh, um, the the what's the word the ref a sort of reflection of Danso because she has some of the same desires. Like she wants to escape a society that has put this um, limits on her in a different way. But the thing is, two things were different. One, she had a different um, sort of like approach to it. Right? She wasn't trying to beat the system. She was trying to basically crush it <laughs> so yeah. um her approach to like dealing with it was completely different she was uh and it, the thing is she uh, another thing was she didn't also even like get there like as she didn't have that from the beginning it wasn't just like she she always knew she was going to crush the system to defeat it it was more of like she was more savvy in thinking how best may i like navigate this you know constraining system that doesn't require me to sacrifice myself. Something like that, right? So she was asking a question that was a bit more, or was a bit braver than Danzo's. Danzo's question was really just, how can I push back in a very like mm -hmm. confrontational way, right? Um, so th that's what I, well, that's what I wanted for her to be like a mirror. And so in that way, even when Danzo is like, well, you could tell from the beginning that they're not very happy to be like a couple of sorts. They're just like a couple of convenience or whatever. Um, and they both know it, but then they're playing different roles and they're playing them differently. But what happened with Ishemi was when I then did that thing where I'm like, I'm, I'm, I started thinking about her axis of power. Where does she exist, right? How is she, how is she privileged? How is she underprivileged? How, where does she have access to? Where does she not have access to? Blah, blah, blah. I started, because doing that means you have to ask the question of then, what do they want and can they get it? And I think when I asked that question for that character, immediately I knew the answer was that it can't be a simple answer and the answer mm -hmm. will require her to be a key major character. And I was like, okay, that means we have a third POV. And I think once that third POV just came, the, the gates just burst open. <laughs> the POV gates, <laughs> metaphorical <laughs> POV gates just burst open. Um, but I then told myself, okay, so who were the people who we needed to hear from um, so I started to think about people like uh, the seconds, a good example, the people who are like, uh, um, what's the word, indentured servants. Mm -hmm. I was like, okay, what do they think, right? Um, how do they how do they navigate the society? Who hates their position? Who loves their position? Et cetera, right? Who is at odds with our, our protagonists? Um, um, and then, so yeah. So once I started to think about their own, the relationships between these three key protagonists and the relationship that orbit them, right? Um, Shemi has Danso, but she also has her mother, who's a fixer, who's a political fixer, mm -hmm. who like shows us more about like the actual political workings that Shemi doesn't have access to, but soon will be a big player and stuff like that. Um, I was also thinking, what does Danso second think about him? 
right? He's trying to push back against the system, but is he part of the system? Who's going to tell him? How's he going to see it? That kind of stuff, right? Um, so yeah, uh, and I think once I did that, then I, the POV is just expanded. But I think what happened to answer your question about managing that, I think I was always asking the question, uh, my POV question, my first POV question is always, who has the most stakes in this chapter? Mm. Who who has the most stakes in this chapter? So something's going to happen. There's five people there. Who has the most stakes? And then I sort of go with that person because that person sort of has the most to gain and or lose with depending on the unraveling of the events. Um, and then the second question, which is sort of um, adjacent to that, is um, is through through uh, through whose POV will we witness like a, like um, not necessarily just like a complex understanding of the situation, but also a complex un- unearthing of character, right? Um, in that scene, so most of the time the answer often will boil back down to the protagonist. If you're centering the protagonist in the story, then yes, they will likely or will mostly have a lot to lose. But sometimes they will not be there or sometimes it will not be about them. And every now and then you get that opportunity. And often I opted in those, when I got those opportunities to showcase someone else, even if it was just for a bit. Um, so that's why you'd get sometimes one person just have one chapter, one POV that single time. I think I, I yeah. think we did have that in this book. A War of the Wind had that too one time, um, and then the, after that you never see a POV from them again. But for that one chapter, their own like stakes were the highest, and so I went with them. So something like that. Um, I did make a lot of revisions. Some of them didn't make it in, mm. uh, <laughs> uh, and I, and sometimes I switched. POVs, like especially when you have multiple protagonists in the scene, that one is kind of hard. It's like who, which of them do you choose to be your POV character? And I remember sometimes I'll write a, I write a chapter from one person's POV or a scene, uh, and then I'll be like, no, and I have to flip it and write to the other person's POV, and it will feel stronger and more organic, and I'd go with that. So, yeah. Well, and I was watching Brent's face as you said, um, Ashime wasn't going to be like, um, <laughs> you know, and, and I think the moment I knew that she was going to be something awesome, um, whether you're, you know, depending on what you think awesome depending is. Depending on how but, you think about yeah, yeah. it. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but the, the POV choice, um, when I think it was one of the first ones with the mother and she's looking at Ashime and being like, okay, she's not reacting to anything. She's like, just the mom's reactions to her daughter. I was just like, oh, okay, something, something's going on here. So I, it was brilliantly done. So the POV choices, I think, and asking those questions, I think is good for our listeners too, as far as if they're juggling multiple point uh, POVs too, like how do you choose which POV to write from? So I think that was, that was awesome. But um, go ahead, Nick. Yeah, so jumping kind of more into like having a large cast, I love what you're saying about like, I'm going to write the POV of who has the highest stakes in, in each chapter. I love that. I've actually never heard that before. So putting that in my bookmark of things to come back to. Uh, but I want to know like kind of techniques that you've used to manage the plot system and um, character arcs with this big of a cast. Oh, I wish I could show you. Um, I have this big sheet. I have a big sheet like this, right? <laughs> um, for for where, for lack of visuals, it's it's a wall. Oh, yeah, <laughs> that's a wall, always, a white um, I, have a, I have this like big post-it that's like massive sheet, right? I can just stick on the wall. And typically, what I do is, um, I I tend to like do that thing where I say, okay, who are my key protagonists? In this book, it's the same three people each time. It's Dan So Lilong and Ashemi, right? Um, and so I start there. I ask myself in terms of thinking about arts, I try to use one word. Okay. This is this is a I'm like, what is the singular thing that this person is pursuing? So um if I'm looking, I'm looking here. Um, um so as I said, as I said in the beginning, <laughs> um, I said this series, The Nameless Republic, is really a series that sort of attempts to answer the question about what is the interaction between truth, freedom, and power as concepts, right? Um, 
so basically all the questions that can arrive from that um if you give if you tell the truth or if you offer people the truth does that lead to their freedom is truth power if you give people power can they shape the truth can is power freedom if you get freedom is it power um you know stuff like that all these questions right that sort of think of the interplay between these three things and one of the things i kept i, I one of the ways i tracked each character was what are they turned toward in this three this uh, triumvirate of concepts which of the things are they facing right now so a good example is danso is oriented toward truth for the whole of book one right he's like i want to know the truth and i want to get that truth out that's his soul that's his north star and so each time i'm always like in tracking his arc then as a character i'm thinking what did he know or have relative to truth in the beginning and what did he have at the end? That's the first question I ask. Okay, so where did he start? Where, did he, where is he going to finish? So, for instance, if he thinks in the beginning, which he does, is like, well, I have this knowledge, truth. If I, if I manage to learn the truth, I will be sort of released from the bonds of like lies that have bound me all my life, right? I'm a scholar. I'm telling these stories about my empire, but they're false, blah, blah, blah. For him, discovering the truth and learning it is his sole driving force. So the question for the ending becomes, if he learns that truth, will he be free? <laughs> will he feel liberated by that truth? Uh, I, would, I would ask you to like think of the end and answer that question for yourself. But the answer is not quite yes at the end, right? I always knew that the answer wasn't going to be quite yes. Um, so it's so almost taking that the truth will set you free and sort of like twisting that <laughs> a bit. That becomes his answer, right? It's like the truth will not always set you free in, the, in that way, or like at least knowing it, um, it might actually be worse. Um, but then others have different. So Shemi's, however, is oriented toward power because she thinks of power as maybe a bigger force. She's, so her whole thing is, if I can gain more power, then I can be free, right? Meanwhile, Danso's whole thing is, if I can gain more truth, then I can be free. So again, in thinking about her arc, I can just say, well, where does she start? Does she have power in the beginning? What kind of power does she have? Does she have power at the end? What kind of power does she have in the end? How does she get there? So that's how I track their arcs, really. I'm just thinking of like one word and one thing they're oriented toward. Um, when it's not this book, if it's any other book, I think the same thing. It, do, what do they want? Do they want to gain something? Uh, I want to win the lottery. So that's their goal. They're oriented toward that goal for the rest of the story. The question is, Will they win the lottery and what will that give them or what do you hope that would give them? Something like that, right? So that's how I track my protagonists, really. I just like pin something to them and watch them make these decisions and see where, like, if those decisions lead them to that goal. Then for the secondary characters, all I just do is ask myself the question of like, um, so I don't, I don't map out my secondary characters. I only map out the protagonists and I usually do that on like this big sheet, right? Uh, and I'll ask questions like, okay, so what are the steps to them achieving this goal, right? For the secondary characters, I tend to do something similar, but also only um, relationally to the person that they have the relationship with. So a good example is Shemi's mother's arc is also tied to a Shemi. So it's like, mm -hmm. as her daughter is progressing towards getting this power, where does she exist relative to a Shemi at the time? And is her her own goal, A, in allyship with Hashemi, or B, against. So that's typically how I think about the secondary character. I'm like, okay, is their goal for or against the person that they're related to? Um, and then typically I just have them sort of be there. Uh, and, and, and then everyone else is a minor character. Really, they don't, <laughs> I don't think too much about them. They don't have goals. Or if they have a specific goal, then I one thing I tend to do with minor characters, funny, is like they're the only people I try to get to just say their goal from the beginning. I, that usually helps me. Like when you meet them the first time, if you if you notice, uh, so a good example is in in Son of the Storm, the first time Ashemi meets this like generals from like the resistance or something, they just stayed out, they just flat out say we hate you or something like that. They just say it, just like we don't like you, you know, uh, go away. Um, this is what we're trying to achieve. And they just flat out say, but that's something I try not to do with my key characters. So it's not too much on the nose. Um, so yeah. And then how do I keep track of these? 
I use spreadsheets. <laughs> so when I have those big when I have those big sheets for the key characters on my computer, I have like uh, I do sort of like relationship groupings, right? So on one column, for instance, I have like a shemi, and I I have all the like on on the big sheet on the wall. I have I know what she's gonna go through. I know the steps, so I don't need to write out the steps. But I ask who's who's gonna be orbiting her the whole time. So her mother is a good example. And then I would say, okay, so Shemi and her mother are like one character group, right? This char- th- these characters are sort of going to be in the same space, usually around the same times, usually, et cetera, right? And then have the next group, uh, say in Son of the Storm, the next group is like Danso and Long are traveling a lot together. So it's like they're a character group as well. So Danso and Long is on one hand. Uh, in the city, Shemi is there with her mother. Um, is anything happening in... Uh, some other part of the city that's you know so i would i usually have like six tracks as a result oh this person is here doing this this person is here doing this this person is here doing this and and that's how i track where each person is at each point in time and and again it's easy because i have my key characters and i always, i just have the other characters being like for or against if i should use that uh, simple way to think about it like are they in allyship or in friction with the key character uh, and so, yeah, I'm, I'm always, I sort of keep aware of where they are at each point in time that way. Yeah. Uh, go ahead, Nick. So, and then if- so I just, uh, I, I want to ask, <laughs> where do you teach? Like, give me some background <laughs> here. Cause I feel like I just took a mini masterclass uh, <laughs> in, in that one. Like I'm texting Marsha here. Like, I feel like a toddler when I like plan my stories, <laughs> like you're, it's so intricate, but you just explained it so well. Like, thank, thanks for diving into that one. That was awesome. Oh, I just want to make a comment. No, no. <laughs> I, I, I'm actually, I teach creative writing. That's what I teach. Actually, yeah. So. yeah well, I'm, I'm yeah. trying to get you to do that. Right here, Sui. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, Sui, where, just so everyone does know, where is it that you teach? So, I, I, I'm uh, I'm an assistant professor of creative writing at the University of Ottawa, which is in uh, Ottawa in Ontario, Canada. Um, I started awesome. there in 2021. So, this is like my third year. Uh, it's been excellent but yes pretty much i've been talking a lot about stuff like this (laughs) Uh, yeah finding ways to talk about the sort of convoluted processes is a thing that i have had to get used to totally very good at it uh brent you want to throw one out there um so my she made question got answered already so uh i I want to ask this other one um now i know like I pretty much feel like all of us run into this when we're doing like these big epic fantasies, but were there like any ideas or characters that got cut out of the final version of Son of the Storm that either you wish you could put in or show up later in Warrior of the Wind? That's a good one, actually, <laughs> because yes, there's always like tons of stuff. Yeah, I had two, three, yeah there, there, um, I'm trying to look if I can quickly like pull this out, out of the my Google Drive as we're speaking, because there are three key things that I deleted um, from Son of the Storm. I can, and, and I shared them with like my newsletter subscribers at some point. Um, I don't know if, if it, they still have access to them. But um, so the first one was, um, I, I'm, and we can talk about spoilers here, right? Yes. Yeah, we didn't say okay. at the top of the show, but we warned everybody yeah. this was happening. So yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So three the three scenes don't get added back to anything. None of these none of the stuff that was caught in Son of the Storm made its way into War of the Wind. Um, mostly because they were, you know, focused on the events of Son of Storm. But um three of them, the deleted scenes I wish would have made it. The first one was that um in the first iteration of the plan, right, to steal this that Nem makes to steal this like Ibor. Um, she doesn't just send um like people out to like go find it. Um, instead, she actually goes to like the most like the guy who has the like most um in influence, right? The most affluent, influent guy who ends up being like an antagonist of sorts later, um, and asks him for an army. <laughs> She's what? like, I want an ar- I want an army. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, and, and there's this, there's this, um, so, so that first, so there's a scene where the first elders show up at Nem's house Mm. and she has to sort of like play this game to like, you know, be nice to them, 
but doesn't tell them that she's already secured the the so i wanted a bit of intrigue so i stri- stripped out her just asking for an army and figured that if she'd already sent like very small f- resources to get what she needed and did get the thing she'd be guarded right and so having mm-hmm. first, first elders just show up at your house would be like do they know what are they here for? So it was sort of raised the intrigue bar a lot. So I went, I opted for that. And it, re- it really made that scene of what is supposed to be a celebration very tense. Um, mm. But in the first one, it's just a meeting. And she straight up just goes to this guy and says, I want an army and I want to go to Desert Lands and just like find these people and get this, this magic thing that I discovered exists <laughs> you know uh, and the guy is like absolutely not <laughs> well, no. <laughs> no no one's gonna give you an army but like eventually he says um i've forgotten how the scene ends but if i look at um this what she does is um yes what she does is she does um she gives this like big speech instead because he refuses she gives this big speech to all the elders and says well i told this guy to give me an army and he said no so she stages an actual uh she stages an actual like a fake murder with pig's blood on an actual person um what yeah to sort of say look this person has been killed by this invader so you must give me this army so i can find this magic thing or else <laughs> we will all the, you know something like that it was a ve- yeah. it was a very you know, dramatic. Well, I asked, I tried, I talked to you, but you didn't. So she goes for this other play that's a bit mm-hmm. dangerous, uh, but but works out because they say, yes, we will give you an army. Uh, but the reason right. I scaled back on that is because we're also thinking about Bassa at the time as like a place that was failing. And so it only pretended to have power, even if it didn't quite. So an army, therefore, would sort of like, someone just having an army would be a bit much. So that's why I skilled. Well, and there's a <laughs> and there's a conversation later in the book too where I can't remember which characters are, but somebody mentions like, "Oh, is there an there's an army?" And they're like, no, yeah, there's no exactly. Army. There's no which army. It's like yeah. the 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 empire is actually too poor to have a, to maintain one. <laughs> so mm-hmm. they mm-hmm. just they just pretend to have one by having like this crackdown on like any sort of dissent or something. Um, so the second deleted scene is actually that, so if you remember sometime when Danso leaves Basa and escapes to this like protectorate, what happens is there's, there's a guy that's sent after them, a specific guy <laughs> who goes with his own like bounty hunting troop, right? And he goes mm. there and there's the showdown. Uh, in the showdown, some people get killed. Um, Danso's second gets killed. The guy himself gets killed. But in the first instance, what actually happens is when Danso and his crew and Lilong, um, uh, and even the woman who helps them, when they arrive in this protectory, they're actually all put in, in prison, all of them, every single <laughs> one of them. Um, and then the envoy arrives, arrives and says, I am a representative of Basa, tasked with bringing them back. And the the leader who's called the Supreme Magnanimous, right? Yeah. <laughs> Who says... Which I love. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, that was just... <laughs> <laughs> so the Supreme Magnanimous says, that doesn't sound right. And she knows something is up, that this guy is not here for them, but here for something more. And that's when she knows they have something that's bigger, that's evil. And so she actually goes back and frees them and says, go, run, because someone is here to kill you. Uh, and then the the eventual trip that the whole of Wadasha takes, right? That protector it takes in the actual book. In the first iteration, it was her just freeing them and giving them directions to the dead mines to say, oh, go, run, cross the border, get into desert lands, be safe. Uh, and then she dies because the envoy real finds out and then kills her. <laughs> but then what happened was I was like, hmm. I don't know, that felt too easy. <laughs> or like yeah. it was a bit too like turn of the heel, right? Um, heel mm-hmm. turn, if I should put it that way. So instead, because that character, the Supreme Magnanimous, for those who have read it, know that she was meant to represent those people who are like struggling to really situate themselves as, as um, um, what's the word? The, as agents of empire, but also mm. people who are trying to protect people. And if any anyone who has ever come from a post-colonial space understands this very well, it's like you know that you understand the power. You know, even even we who like exist in you know hyper-capitalist 
today understand like you understand the power of this big force that's pressing on you and it's hard to actually fight back against that force and so you invest so much in like protection right in protecting your people but the problem with that is that will mean you sort of you know often have to give in to this and it's like it's the cognitive is the the cognitive dissonance right of that so she's she's a character that's like struggling with that and i didn't want her to just like make a complete heel turn and be like go i will sacrifice myself to save you i felt it was a bit dramatic so <laughs> i was like rather she's forced to make that decision which is what happens in the book which is when they get there they do meet the envoy and the envoy is like hand over the prisoners and she's like you can't just take my you can't just take my people <laughs> like I'm, this is my turf you you can't just do that and so the eventual um journey they take away is her um being forced into making that decision because once they murder the envoy she's like then we can't stay here because if we stay here we're dead so we have to leave and so they all leave together including her um and she ends up becoming a key character in, especially in book 2 uh Kakutan that's the supreme magnanimous oh character. i love that character yeah 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 <laughs> and then the third is um the funeral where shemi starts her revolution of sorts um <laughs> where she gives this lengthy speech that riles up the populace um prior what so at the end of that funeral in the book she's rescued by who turns out to be her love interest who in the beginning is like against her but like later ends up being someone she relies heavily on um and and that sort of gives her a bit of power later too because the people tend to um start to like support her but in the previous scene she was actually captured when she makes that speech like she's literally like dragged off stage and put in prison um and then why why this scene is which this scene is the one i really wish is that she negotiates her way out of prison <laughs> by by right. by literally telling them <laughs> you can keep me here and this will happen or you can let me go and this will happen um and i felt like it was one of those scenes where she just stays in prison the whole time plotting like this is how i'm going to get out and it's not going to be rescue it's me just telling them you're going to let me out because if you don't here's what's going to happen um and and the uh, the the elders who put her in are actually incensed because they know she's right and she literally walks out of that prison untouched just via you know with the power of words <laughs> so um <laughs> that was like i felt like that was like a very um quintessential ishemi action that would have like been excellent to have in a book but it didn't make it because she didn't go into prison <laughs> so so yeah um yeah those are sorry I went on too long for those uh, but like th- that no, was like fine. they were exciting as uh, things that I really loved and I I caught them but like I kept those three specifically uh because I wanted to answer this question when anyone asks me so <laughs> there you yeah, and I knew I knew this would be a good one because it's like <laughs> everyone I feel like anyone who does like secondary world there's always stuff you don't get to put in and you're like shit I wish I could have put it in but so yeah now I knew it would be a good one I feel like in talking about this book and this series, um, we have to talk about um, the cast system, I think. Um, so uh, what's your inspirations for the cast system in this book? Um, you know, uh, skin tone, how people look at each other, seconds, all that kind of stuff. Like, I'm curious what's drawn from, you know, because we were talking earlier about what's drawn from, uh, you know, the, the, the past, the history, history. and stuff like that yeah. um, and that kind of thing. So just curious about that. And then we'll get into our last couple of questions. Sure. Um, the cast system came from a couple of things. I think the first choice I made there was I wanted to, I, I was asking myself, do I make this cast system overt, i.e. codified into law? And by law, I mean like, you know, um, like, so should I make it codified into law or do I make it, sub, you know, it subvert, um, so like, a caste system sort of on the download. It exists and it functions, but there's plausible deniability <laughs> of mm-hmm. its existence, which is like very akin to our own world. <laughs> um, <laughs> so um, I opted for the former because I wanted to complexify the system. And I realized that if I made it too subverse, if it was a, like a system that was more on the download, it'd be hard to complexify it because it could, it ran the risk of getting confusing. 
complicated and confusing. So I was like, okay, I'm going to codify some things, then throw the complexity into that codification. So the first thing is that I wanted, I was like, how do the people look at themselves? That was where it started, right? How do the people of Basa look at themselves before we even start talking about how they look at others, right? So the first thing was Basa as a nation is the center of the universe, right? That universe. And the reason they consider themselves that way is because they're successful. And the reason they're successful is because they sit on the most, um, on the most, uh, you know, so piece of the, the piece of land that generates the most wealth, mm. agriculture, resources, all that stuff. They happen to sit on that piece of land, which is the mainland proper. That's what has the most, you know, is is most blessed, right? And so, taking the 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 idea of like we are a blessed people because we have all the best stuff. And merging it with like the belief system they have about their own origins as people, i.e., they have this idea of like being being they venerate these moon gods and they consider these moon gods like the these deities as like the the people who watch over them, right? So they consider their blessing um, as because they are um, what's the word? They are blessed by the moon gods. That's where they are thriving and successful. That's the idea. That's how Basa sees itself. So where the, the where the skin tone thing comes into play is actually from there, the land. The idea, you'd see it in the texts of the story where they say, those who have been blessed by the moon gods look more like the land than those who have not been blessed by the moon gods. <laughs> that's mm. how they look. That's how they think of skin tone. It is less of like just tone, but like it's something very arbitrary. It's like, well, yeah. the land clearly gives us everything, life, wealth. We thrive. We are powerful. Therefore, this land is blessed. Therefore, if the more you, like the land you are, the more blessed you are. It doesn't make sense to you and I as I say it, but the funny thing is like, I would, I would argue that every single power system we have in the world exists in this exact same way. <laughs> it's the most mm -hmm. arbitrary thing that's the foundation. It's just something very basic and ridiculous. But when you build so much on that foundation, that foundation gets lost somewhere along the way. So that's how the skin tone thing starts for Basa. Now, then Basa looks, so with, based on that, it then divides itself into two caste systems. Those who look like the land and those who look less like the land. And that's why you have the first two tiers of the Basai caste system. Then you have the next two tiers, which are immigrant caste systems, <laughs> which is anyone who is not from the core mainland, therefore cannot clearly be blessed by the moon gods at all. So if they're from anywhere outside, i.e. if you're from the desert lands or from the islands and they come into this place, it is impossible for them to exist on the same level as we are, who are blessed by the moon gods. Therefore, they have two tiers below the Basai caste system. The first of their tears is the more they look like us, the more they are blessed by the moon gods. The less they look like us, the less they are blessed by the moon gods. So therefore, even the immigrant caste system is then divided into two. So you have those two tiers. So that's four tiers now. And then the fifth tier, the final tier, which is the bottom, is everyone else that doesn't fit the first four that's that's it that's the system in a summary right that's how this that's how i i thought up, up the system it's like anyone that doesn't fit the first four or is not a seamless fit into the first four um is is gonna fit that fifth fifth so that fifth is sort of like a catch-all for everyone from like people like danso who are like mixed heritage they're like what is that i don't know what that is fifth Fifth tier, you know, we don't we don't understand that, you know. Um, and then the other thing was also how much movement was possible. So a good example is you could see some people from the immigrant tiers could move from the lower immigrant tier to the higher one, but they couldn't move into the Basai tier. That's mm -hmm. a good example of what could happen. Um, it could also be that people in the same family could become belong to two different tiers just because they look different. So a good example is Nem belongs to a lower tier, Ishemi belongs to a higher one. 
be, just like by ver- by accident of birth, as mm-hmm. they say. So access and all these things matter differently. But then within those same systems, you have someone like Danso who has a specific skill that is desired by the topmost tier. And they find it strange that someone who they understand to not be blessed by the moon gods has that gift. And so they're like, well, I guess if he has it, maybe the moon gods made a mistake and blessed him somehow. So we can let him in to our (laughs) tier, but not completely. We also have to remind him of where he's really from, which is a fifth tier. But he may have access to the university. He may have access to our classes, but he's not going to be fully integrated. So like a good example is in the class. And at university, Danso has a special seat. He doesn't seat with the other students. He doesn't right, sit with the other right. students. He has a special seat separate from them. Um, so I didn't want to like use the same terms for like segregation and all of that. But you can see all these things are clearly there. And the system is codified to some degree, not codified to some degree. Now, the, the other thing is the further you move away from Bassa, the more all of this falls apart. Because the first thing that happens in War of the Wind is when Danso leaves Bassa and goes outside into desert lands, suddenly people look they run like people look differently across the spectrum of like skin tones, mm-hmm. shades, hair, hair, hair texture, stuff like that. And there's no, there's no class system, but some parts of the desert lands have that more than others. The, those that are more in tune with Basa, for instance, still practice it to some degree, maybe not as codified into law, but they, they use the, they, they measure with their eyes. Right. <laughs> and mm-hmm. still say, well, you look like you could be a, you know, um, but the further away from Bassa they move, the more all that structure falls apart. And if you move far away from Bassa enough, it just disappears completely. That's what a lot of what happens in War of the Wind demonstrates that, that it disappears the minute you leave Bassa. Um, so yeah, that in, in summary, that's how I thought about the caste system. And then other ways it could be, it could be manifested, um, clothing, um, hairstyles, um, you know, even markers of like authority, right? Like uh, how many, how many, like the hair, for instance, hairstyle had a c- certain number of arcs you could wear on your hair. If you right. were a certain caste, you couldn't wear past a certain number, stuff like that. Uh, certain clothing, how do people in certain, uh, even where they lived, right? The districts, the words they lived in, the closer to the great dome you lived, the more you'd be in a higher caste, the further, the lower your caste went. Right. Um, who, who, who was allowed to be, in the same district with someone else, what districts were mixed, what districts were like, you know, required to be only certain castes, all that kind of stuff is just there. Um, but it started with that basic line of like, you know, the moon gods, blessings, the land, and who has the most of that versus who doesn't. And then from there, it just expands and becomes a system that proliferates. Awesome. Uh Thank you for, I, I, I don't know. I love this book and I just, I feel like we just barely touch the surface here. Um, but do I need to go to Nick or will, will you're closing us out? Nick, you have something else? So, uh, yeah. So I want it's a kind of follow up question to the cast system here and, and kind of how beside looks at people based on skin tones and things like that, you use the term yellow skin, uh, hmm. which as we know that is a derogatory term for asian americans and you have some a character named lee long like yeah. to me i'm like okay there's a bigger theme going on here there there is something else going on other than the term that you're using that means something bigger i kind of yeah. want it like can you explain some of that to me and, and what you know what your decision making was going into that to use that term um and what you're speaking to with that yeah, I mean, this this one can be quick because there's actually an author note in the second book that talks a bit about that. But yes, this is something that has come up like in reviews. And one of the things that I often say is, oh yeah, absolutely, 100%. Um, so because I was thinking about the gamut of like phenotypical um, um, presentations of people, right? Like, so which includes like skin tone ranges. One of the things that happens um, is on the African continent, the, Albinism has a very specific space that it occupies. So um, in in many languages, not just indigenous languages, but also in English or how Nigerians, for instance, will speak English, people would reference someone who's very light skinned as yellow. That's just a thing. It's not, it's a, it's a descriptor. It's not derogatory. It's pretty much the same thing um, 
I, I think it's even used in other places, like in in you know, West Indies, for instance. I think that in the Caribbean, it's like spaces where people would use yellow as descriptor, um, and specifically or especially so, uh, especially for folks with albinism, like description using yellow as a descriptor is like not always. I, I wouldn't say it's, some people can use it derogatorily, but typically it's just a descriptor. Uh, and my use was pretty much very akin to that. It was more like, this is a description. Um, but the other thing too was I also, at the same time, wanted to pinpoint how that can be used, weaponized, right? So in the story, it is weaponized by people because actually in the African continent and many parts of the continent, it is also weaponized against people with albinism. Um, and I wanted to mirror that. So in fact, there are these things where Dancer will literally re repeat some of the things that he's being told about people who look like that. And Lilong will be like, does that make any sense to you? Right. It's, it, and some of the things that Danso repeats are even like direct lifts from literal things that people on the African continent say today in 2023. Right. So um, I was, I wanted to like reference that and show that because that doesn't often show up in a lot of fiction, especially fiction, African fiction that I wanted it to not just show up in like, I didn't even want it to show up like, oh, this is a book that just writes about albinism. I wanted it to be like persons with albinism just randomly showing up in books that center people of all, like if we're looking at a range of the way people look, right? So that was that was really where it started. And then it just happened. And I didn't, of course, as I was writing, I didn't see anything wrong with the term until, of course, Americans read it and were like, well, here's this other way it could be interpreted. Um, and I'm just going to point out that the name Lilong is actually just a short, um, shortened version of the Lilongwe River, which is an actual river in East Africa. So it's not even necessarily. <laughs> so it, it was like literally, as you say it, someone else also saying, "Oh, this are you? Does this have any reference to?" And I was like, "Well, first of all, I'm not even American. Like, I don't know. <laughs> I don't have. <laughs> I, I'm not drawing from there. I'm not drawing from that reference. I don't have that history. I don't." know that history i'm not working with that history so even if i can understand if someone else could be like this could sound like this well i think i think any discerning reader at least would say well clearly nothing here points like there's no everyone in in son of the storm and this book is like a black person essentially so like it's impossible for that to be the case um, but I could understand, and I remember writing this response to this reviewer to say, well, I can understand how you could have that concern, but um, I just want to you know, assuage your fears. That is not the case. Um, and also, I hope discerning readers, most discerning readers walked away with that understanding. So, um, yeah, yeah. No, I, I was curious because I, I felt like there was a bigger meaning that I was missing behind there, and you contextualized yeah. that perfectly. Um, so, because I, I didn't, for once, think you were using that in in the way in which yeah. other people had interpreted. So, thank you for yeah. explaining that. That actually like opens up a lot for me on that one. Okay, Brent. Brent. Yeah. Yeah. Just to kind of piggyback off that, I think sometimes American audiences we have to learn to stop making ourselves the center of the universe when it comes to <laughs> the things we read and the stuff we see. Cause I remember this controversy happened not too long ago where this artist from South Africa was being given crap for saying colored. And it's like, well, colored yes, has I remember, I remember that one. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I like remember that one too. <laughs> yeah. It's like color has yeah. an entirely different context in South Africa. So you got to kind of chill and like take a breath. And like, you know, I think, I think, Social media has a part to play in this, where we're all like ready to like attack dog when we see something. It's like, well, no, I'll take look at the wider work, think of the like larger context. Because for me, I definitely saw um I, I'm gonna say it wrong about albinoism. Yes, I said it right. Yeah, that's what that's what that's why I picked up on. When I read it just because I did have some of that reference and how you know those those people get treated on the on certain parts of the continent. So that's that was kind of like. That's what I drew from it. So I think like I, for me, at least I would if, I would encourage listeners to like if you have a certain viewpoint, be careful and kind of be be mindful to decenter yourself from it. Sometimes if your first reaction is to wonder at things like that. And to be fair, I, I did think about it as a teaching moment, too. Right? I wasn't really offended or anything. Um, I was surprised, but I was like, oh, that's true. I didn't really think about that. But I didn't think about that because I don't have that history. <laughs> so, right, right, right. But, but like, yeah, um, I was like, OK, well, this is an opportunity for people to understand that a lot of folks 
especially a lot of black folks around the world use that expression for different people in the same um within the same racial groups just to reference you know skin shade um and that's fine because it's not as i said it's not always derogatory um so yeah that's that's pretty much it but at the same time i think again if you're a discerning reader and you actually read the book clearly you can see them clapping back even at the term in the book <laughs> literally in the text of the book people are saying stop saying that so i mean yeah <laughs> so, right all right well take us home silly. uh yeah i'm gonna ask that one question i just want uh we pitched us the second book in the trilogy which just so everyone knows is out now and it's called warrior of the wind thank you very much that's uh let's see how do i pitch warrior of the wind um <laughs> and Ooh, i'm about to boy. pick it up because I, I i cannot wait okay. to read the second book <laughs> i will i will i will pitch it three different ways here's the first one when i was asked to write this series when i was asked when when I was told, well, this book will want to buy it as a series, I don't really thought about Son of the Storm. So I, I I developed a shorthand for deciding what the story for the three books will be, the overall arc. And the first one was book one, introduce yourself introduce readers to the world. Book two, break the world. Book three, think about or book three. So book one introduces readers to the world. Book two breaks the world, and book three tries to imagine what the world that may rise from the rubble of the broken world will look like. That is basically, so book two is the breaking the world book. Okay. So that's number one. <laughs> Second way I'll pitch it is, I think is, is what I will use as like comps. So if you are um, a fan of, Rebecca Ron Horses Black Sun. If you are if you loved Andor and if you mm-hmm. liked The Woman King, the film, book three book two is those three things. <laughs> that's that's the second pitch, right? That's the comp pitch. Now here's the third pitch. When I started writing again, one of my shorthands was book one. Is gonna be Danso's story. Book two is gonna be Li Long's story, and book three is gonna be Shemi's story. Um, loosely, not completely, but what book two does is because it then fronts and centers Li Long as the key character. Um, we then move outside of Basa. So pretty much for book two, we are witnessing everything that's happening outside of Basa. We get to visit more places. We get to see more fantastic beasts. We get to see pretty much more of the world, more of everything you loved about son of the storm but more okay (laughs) um here are some things you might love in that book there is a heist uh a prison heist this is not a spoiler because it's literally in the first third of the book there's a prison heist okay to rescue someone uh if you love prison heists you will love this if you love indiana jones-esque buried cities forgotten cities you will love this. If you like the idea of a sentient hurricane, you will like this. If you <laughs> like um, quests that involve um, a motley band of travelers, but amongst which there is a throuple with a baby, you will like this. If you like um, double crossovers, double double crosses, triple crosses, <laughs> you will like this. Um, if you if you love to see uh there's a if you love to see <laughs> there's a specific creature called a swamp dragon called a ninki nanka it's a swamp dragon that is specifically specific to west african folklore if you love to see a swamp dragon uh you will like this so uh does is that enough of a pitch <laughs> yeah that's great Honestly, you could have stopped at the first couple i you had me already and now i have i've literally just finished downloading the second book so i'm going to start yeah. listening pretty quick the great. second book is so far my favorite of anything that I've read that you've written. Um, oh, that's nice. I'm glad. I've read everything. <laughs> um, so our next question, which we leave this with all our guests for the last question, is what keeps you writing this series? Contract. <laughs> 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 I 
I mean, let's start there. Let's be. Let's be. Yeah. <laughs> let's yeah. be real. Yeah, not, right? yeah I, I have to write it, or else someone someone's gonna send me an email. But and, yeah, but yeah, <laughs> outside of outside of of um, contract demands, um, I think first of all, I want. I want to see how I can land the plane safely, as they say, right? With with trilogies, it's like, how do you land the plane, right? And how do you do so? Um, I met I met Fonda Lee this year, uh, and I remember like asking her, like, how did you do it? How did you land Jade Legacy so well? Like, uh, and she, you know, she talks about all these things, and I realized that um, tr- trilogies, unlike other books, really give you a sense of like creating like really truly taking something for a ride and landing it like it, it really feels like that it feels like you're a pilot like you take this plane to the air and like you land it safely that a single book doesn't always do um and i and so like that to start the drive to like take these characters to an end that is befitting of them that is befitting of the story, the world, that is befitting of me, the author, that's befitting of the readers who have followed this story. I think like that at the core is what drives me um, to finish or to complete this work or to continue writing this work. The other thing is because um, this is something I always say in my world building classes. When I build a world, I typically think of the world as a world that exists that multiple stories can exist in. So in this way, I'm always thinking about this story as one complete arc that exists in this world. And I think the people, because people are going to ask this question, everyone asks this question, will there be more stories in this world? And the answer to that is typically that when you finish the one that you are writing in that world, you will know, right? And I'm, I'm sort of like itching to answer that question. Like how much room is there for more stories in this world? will be answered by the fact of fin- of writing the third book, of completing the series, of completing the story and saying this story has, this specific arc in this world is complete. Th- this journey with these specific characters is complete, but there is room for more. And this is how much room there is for more. I- I- I'm itching to answer that question. Uh, and one way to answer that question is to continue writing. But then the last one is just, I need, I want to, you know, savor the last book <laughs> like it, mm. the amount of time i have to spend with these characters this what you see here for those who can't see it's like a sheet of like post-its and sticky note stuff this is book three okay this mm. is all book three here <laughs> on the wall right here these are chapters and scenes and stuff um so I'm, I'm hard at work at it um it's excellent it's exciting it's 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 bigger uh, than like the second book was bigger than the first the third one is bigger than both <laughs> not not size wise it's not chunky it's just bigger like scope wise thinking wise introspection wise um you know if there were two, one if there was one beast in book one there's three in book two there's like five in book three it's like that everything <laughs> is just more um so yeah if they ask if you ask me what is how is book two rel- relative to book one more how is book three relative to book two more uh, even more so um yeah i just want to savor that for as much as possible um and land the plane safely yep awesome well see i can't thank you enough for being on with us again um talking about your work i am stoked by the second book third book i i don't know i just we'll, we'll have you back <laughs> we gotta do it again because you're you're a delight to have on and thank you for your time and thank you for your amazing world Appreciate Absolutely. It. Anytime. Um, always uh, fun and exciting hanging out with you guys. Thanks, man. And this has been Just Keep Writing, a podcast for writers, by writers, to keep you writing. You can find us at justkeepwriting.org. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. Feel free to reach out to any of us on our social medias, and please jump in our Just Keep Writing Discord channel. Links to all of that is in the show notes. Lastly, please support our show by going to patreon.com slash justkeepwriting. We offer daily writing prompts, early access to podcast episodes, and much more. Thanks for listening, and just keep writing.